I stood up and I wiped my tears. I said in my brain these exact words. You have two options right now, prison or death. This is gonna be my most revealing and vulnerable video ever. I was addicted to meth for over two years. You watch me for a while, then you know that I've never really hidden the fact that my favorite dance partner in my 20s was drugs. Oh, how we dance. I have to start this video with a trigger warning. I'm gonna be talking about drug abuse and my experience where I spiraled out of control, um, which may trigger some people who have used drugs in the past. So just be aware of that. I think it's important to share stories like this because it shows that even in the grips of a powerful narcotic, we can overcome, we can change behaviors, and we can heal. It's possible, and if I did it, then you can too. All right, so every journey has a beginning. So Patrick, where did this drug thing begin? How the hell did you become such a meth head? Early 20s, and I went to Fly Nightclub here in Toronto, which was an after hours. A buddy took me there, and I remember being there, and I don't even know what time of the night it was, no clue. But I remember saying to him, I'm tired, I'm gonna just go home. And he said, come here. And he put a pill in my mouth. Of course I took it because back then I just took whatever. And like 20 minutes later, I was having the time of my life. And it turns out that pill was ecstasy. Actually, first I felt like throwing up. <laughs> And then I had a smile plastered on my face and the floodgates just opened from there. Like every weekend I was going out, I was a weekend warrior, I was counting the days until the weekend. I'm sure many of you can relate. Then I moved to Los Angeles. That's when I really discovered the circuit party. I was going to these mega circuit parties, white party, pink party, purple party, tartan party, Every friggin' Folsom Fair, Black Party, New York, Miami, LA, Palm Springs, every single party, we were there on the dance floor doing the entire weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So that's when I really started to experiment with heavier drugs, doing E, G, T, K, trail mix together, smoking it, snorting it, drinking it, you know, swimming in it, whatever it was. The circuit parties, we were fucked up. So eventually, my weekend warrioring started to bleed into the week. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Now, I, I think a turning point for me was like the Monday. Now I'm getting high on a Monday. That really turns the corner and makes it into something else. You didn't have a compartmentalized place where, hey, this is where you party and do drugs, and this is where you're sober and doing normal life. It just started to blend into each other, and thus began my downward spiral. Okay, but for somebody like me, like, what is a day-to-day -day life like on meth? So I was probably spending about $300 a week probably at least $1,200 US a month just on meth. Wake up in the morning or come to in the morning and I would reach for my bong. And then I would go about my business. I wouldn't stray too far from home or if I, because I had my bong at home because I did it with a bong because in my head I thought, oh, if I'm using a bong, it's got water, the water's cooling, the, the smoke, it's not so bad for my lungs. So it's a better way of doing it for me. If I was going away from home for an extended period of time, then I would just have my pipe with me. And I would just carry that with me, and then I could just duck into a restroom somewhere and smoke that. I would do all of my normal things that I would be doing anyway. I was just high when I was doing that. Of course, because you're so high, you're gonna miss some sleep, and that's where real trouble gets in. Probably miss two nights of sleep. Usually, on average, I was miss missing about two nights of sleep. But after the second night, I usually would pass out that third night because my body was just done. It's holed up in my room because my room was really my safe space. And anybody who's done this type of drug will know what I'm talking about. Finding this like safe space where you can shut the door, you shut the curtains, you really block out the world, and you create this weird little drug bubble world where 
you know, on my walls, I had plastered like all these magazine covers. I always had these weird creative projects on the go. Like I installed this pulley system where I had this like chandelier come down and I would put candles in it and light the candles and then have a pulley system because I had a high ceiling in my room. And then I would pull it up and the chandelier would lift to the ceiling like this. Um, I had a huge aquarium with all of these fish. And I remember once I was trying to move the aquarium with all the water in it. And I was trying to move the aquarium and the aquarium twisted like this. And all of the water, gallons of water dumped out all over the floor. Fish were flopping on the floor. It was a nightmare. But it's one of, it, it's a perfect example of something that you would never do when you were sober but seems like a good idea when you're high. If you know somebody who's on meth in the throes of meth, you know what I'm talking about. Their, their living space is a disaster. They're, com they're always renovating something. They're always fixing something. Their bathroom is probably a mess. You know, they're taking apart cabinets. They're, they're building things. Even during all of this mess and all of this fogginess and weird behavior, and I remember in the throes of that, walking down the street with my best friend, and we were going to our, one of our favorite little burger joints. And I remember turning to him, and I was high as a kite then as well. But I turned to him and I said, you know, I'm gonna look back on this time and say, remember those two and a half years I was high on meth? And I think that's a powerful thing to focus on because even in my midst of my meth haze, I was laying the groundwork that this was a period of time in my life that I was going through and experiencing but was going to end. It's like in my brain I knew this was temporary. People often ask me, Patrick, what was your rock bottom? And I think for me there was a few rock bottoms actually because I was so disciplined in the taking of the drugs that I was not going to let it go. I was going to ride this train as long as I could. So there was a few rock bottoms for me. I remember one time I was hanging out with a buddy at his place and we were being all methy. Um, and then I heard through the grapevine the very next day, his place was raided by police and he was in jail. I mentioned before, it was wildly expensive. I don't know how I lasted so long doing this and paying for it, but when there's a will, there's a way. Uh, eventually I ran out of money. I started emailing people, calling people, begging people for rent money because I couldn't even pay my rent anymore because all of the money I was spending on drugs. So of course, by this point, I was doing it every day. I was staying up for days at a time. I would hear voices and I thought that these voices were my neighbors. And wait for it, I thought my neighbors were talking shit about me. There was a whole story in my head, listen to this. There was three of them, two guys and a girl. Now the girl was dating one of the guys. The guys were kind of dicks. Uh, one guy was homophobic and the other guy was kind of a dick. And the girlfriend was the only one that was really defending me. So they were talking shit about me in the other room. Um, where, you know, one guy didn't really care to get involved. The other guy was saying all these like weird homophobic and, um, you know, like picking on me for being gay, picking on me for my drug use and really, um, belittling me and calling me names and stuff. And his girlfriend was defending me and saying, Hey, stop it. Come on. He's a good guy. You know, just leave him alone. Blah, blah, blah. This was in my head. This isn't real. There were no conversations. There aren't three roommates next door talking about me. That's how fucked up I was. They had me in tears. I would literally be in my room and I had to put on headphones and crank music to drown out the sound of my neighbors talking shit about me who didn't even exist. Rock bottom, you think? The final, final straw was when I went to my neighbor's house, just in the next building. He was a dealer and a drug user. And I could hear, I was in the hallway and I could hear him inside his unit. And I was knocking on the door trying to get in because I had no more drugs. And I was coming down and I was starting to like freak. So I'm knocking on his door trying to get in and I hear him in there and I'm begging him to open the door. 
Now, was he actually in there? Who knows? I've heard voices in the past, maybe he wasn't even in there. The point is, I couldn't get in his place and I felt this desperation and helplessness because I couldn't get in to get my stuff. And I didn't have any more money at this point either, so I was relying on his kindness. When I realized that I couldn't get through that door into his place to get the meth, to ease my suffering, I collapsed in front of his door, put my hands on my face like this and just started bawling in a public hallway in a building, <laughs> bawling in front of the door, weeping, and that was the final straw. I stood up and I wiped my tears and I thought to myself, Patrick, this is it. This is not only a ro another rock bottom, it's the final straw. I said in my brain these exact words. You have two options right now, prison or death. Those are the only two options for you at this point. That's where your life is going. Is that what you want for yourself? Is that what you want? Prison or death? I walked out of his building that day determined that I was going to quit meth. Well, of course, after hitting rock bottom and having that realization, there's a few steps that I did that helped in my recovery for sure. Number one, I threw out all of my paraphernalia. I had bongs, I had pipes, I had butane lighters, I had baggies, I had everything. I took all of that stuff, I put it in a bag, I marched myself downstairs outside my building and I threw it all into the garbage bin. Number two, I deleted all the contacts in my phone that had anything to do with meth. Dealers, friends that I would, even hookups. Uh, the people that you know that you hook up with just to do it, just to have sex and do it, just to, whatever it is. Anybody at all who was connected with that deleted their contacts. And to be honest, the mental aspect was a lot harder than the physical aspect of overcoming this. I literally had to remind myself that I did not need meth to survive, to live. Like, it sounds ridiculous, but I had to continuously remind myself that my life would be better without it, that I would be healthier without it, and that I actually didn't need it to live like you need air and food and water. I ate when I was hungry and I ate as much as I wanted and I ate whatever I wanted. I drank as much as I want, so much water. I drank so many, so much juice, so much replenishing my body. I was going to the gym a lot. And I remember running on the treadmill, sweating and sweating and just running and running and sweating and thinking. And my, my inner monologue was, get the fuck out of me get the fuck out of me, meaning the drugs. I was envisioning that when I was running and I was sweating, that the drugs were coming out through my sweat and dripping off my body and away and out of my system. It was all about, it was all about extraction. And of course, the first few days were the hardest and you're really counting the first few days. But the point where I knew that I really had kicked this habit, was when I lost count of days. I lost count. I was one, two, a week went by, two weeks and three weeks. But at some point I lost track of time. I forgot the number of days that I was off of drugs. That really gave me a boost to be like, whoa, wait a minute, you got this. I was in so deep for so long. You might be thinking, Patrick, how do you know you're over it? How do you know that you truly have a handle on this? And I know you're gonna hate me for saying this and I'm gonna get comments saying, I can't believe you put yourself in that position, in that situation. I have since been in rooms where people are doing math, offered me some, and I politely declined, saying, no, thank you, I don't do that anymore. If that's not having a handle on the situation, then I don't know what is. And just the fact, I think I needed, I think I put myself in those rooms on purpose because I need to show myself that I am in complete, 
control of this situation. So of course, all of this is coming up because I'm doing my 90 day no drinking challenge. Now, I went into this challenge with a lot of confidence. Patrick, you did it with meth, you can do it with booze. However, there's a big difference, and I mentioned this in another video, you don't often see people doing meth on TV. Every single show and movie, people are drinking, and to excess, every scene, people are drinking, pouring drinks, clinking glasses. It's always in your face, and that's what makes drinking so much more difficult. Everyone is drinking. All of the time. It's so accepted by society. Expected. Accepted <laughs> by society. It's so interwoven with the moments of our lives. I'd like to propose a toast. And therein lies the challenge with drinking. If you know somebody that needs help, they can get help. I'm gonna put some resources in the description below where people can get help. Because you can get help, you can overcome this, and you can win the fight. And you know what helps me win my fight every single day are my patrons. Patrons of my channel get perks like advanced access to episodes, behind the scenes content, personalized videos, and so much more. You can find the link to join my Patreon page in the link below this video. And a huge shout out to my newest patrons, Joseph, Jasmine, and Mike. Thanks for watching guys, and I will see you in the next video. Mwah.